Well, hello there. Welcome to our study of the book of Ruth. And whenever we enter the Word of God, we want to do it with prayer, so let's bow our hearts. Father, we thank you for this precious book. We thank you for this time together. And we solicit the Holy Spirit to open this book and our lives to your Word, that we might grow in grace and the knowledge of our precious Savior, in whose name we commit this time, in Jesus' name indeed. Amen. The book of Ruth, and uh, we're in the first of four sessions, and uh, it's very strange if somebody asks you, what's my favorite book of the Bible? There's a lot of good candidates, Genesis, Revelation, whatever, but I have to say that uh, very likely the book of Ruth would be at the top of the list. That may sound strange, a little tiny four-chapter book. Uh, this little book is venerated even in secular college literature classes. It's considered one of the most elegant love stories uh, in writing. But it also encapsulates that which we call the romance of redemption. But one of the things we'll need to do in order to really understand this book is to lay it against the fabric of ancient Israel. There are three groups of laws that, we, that are very strange that we need to understand and about redemption, gleaning, and the Leverite marriage. So we'll get into those as we go. But to be prepared for some surprises. And why this particular book? You know, it's interesting that this book, little four-chapter narrative, little love story, is one of the most dramatic books of prophecy in the Bible. And the ancient Jewish scriptures often included the book of Ruth with the book of the prophets. And that may surprise you. But it, uh, um, we regard this book as an essential prerequisite to a study of the book of Revelation, by the way. And uh, one, of our, one of my basic themes in my ministry, as you know, is that these 66 books we call the Bible are a single message system, intricately designed. Every detail is there deliberately by design. And we're going to see some of that unfold as we go forward here. Now, in Ruth, every detail not only carries the romance along, but it carries along the romance of redemption. We need to understand what do we mean by redemption. And so it's going to give us, you and me, it's going to give us a perspective of God's plan for us. You and I are going to be profiled here in a, it's a very surprising way. We're going to discover a concept called the goel. In Hebrew, it's called the kinsman redeemer. What is that really all about? And you won't understand Revelation chapter 5 unless you really understand this background. You're also going to see the distinctives between Israel and the church. One of the tragic byproducts of Christianity today is confusion on that subject. God has a specific plan for Israel, a specific plan for the church, and they're, in a certain sense, mutually exclusive. They're parallel, but separate. And uh, so, one of the things we also want to adjust ourselves to is that there are multiple levels of understanding. There's, of course, typically a primary application, historical, an event that actually happened, it occurred in the time of the judges. We want to understand the period during which this, these events take place. And that's the historical sense. But there's another aspect to our study, and that's what we'll call practical, or homiletic, if you will. How do you apply it to our own lives? There's going to be things here that uh, we'll want to be sensitive to. We're also going to discover some prophetic revelations some mystic or prophetic insights that will come that may surprise you. And then, of course, in, in the Hebrew hermeneutic, they have an area they call the remez. That's a hint of something deeper. Sometimes there'll be a little issue that will open the door to a whole nother perspective. And we'll see some of that occurring here too. Hermeneutics is the theory of interpretation. And um, as I pointed out earlier, that uh, there are over 200 rhetorical devices or figures of speech in the Bible. And we notice in Hosea chapter 12, 10, God says, I've spoken by the prophets and I have multiplied visions and used similitudes by the ministry of the prophets. 
Similitudes are just one of 200 different kinds of rhetorical devices you find in the Scripture. We tend to think in Greek terms, which is prophecy is a prediction and fulfillment. That's what we think of as prophecy. That's the Greek mind at work. A prediction and its fulfillment. That's not the Hebrew model. The Hebrew model is a little different. Prophecy is pattern. One of the things you'll discover as you study the Hebrew literature is they continually uh, see patterns. The patterns of the Messiah are profiled in Israel and vice versa. They're very, very oriented to patterns. And we're going, we're going we, we, we see that when we study Genesis 22, the Akedah. It's that, a pattern where Abraham knows he's acting out prophecy that several thousand years later on that very spot, another father did offer his son and so forth. And uh, so prophecy is pattern. We're going to see one of the most phenomenal patterns in the Bible in these little four chapters. And so there are going to be critical links in the chain we're going to look at. We're going to see Bethlehem. Why is Bethlehem relevant? Why is Bethlehem associated with the house of David? We take that for granted, but why? Because of our Christmas cards, maybe, right? Because of Micah 5, 2, and so on. The cross, of course, is the pivotal event in the entire universe. And the crown that Jesus is destined to wear is also in the picture here. The throne of David will be a topic we'll discuss. And the issues that will come, of course, will be the kinsman redeemer. What do we really mean by that? And, of course, the distinction between the church and Israel. We want to be sensitive to those issues. The book of Ruth. It opens up with a phrase, in the days the judges ruled. We need to understand that. This is a period... After Moses, but before the king. There's an era there in which the judges ruled. It was not a good time. It was one of the spiritual valleys, if you will, in their history. But within that dark period when the judges ruled, we're going to see the ultimate love story. It's a love story at the literary level. It'll be a love story at the prophetic and personal levels. And strangely enough, this book is probably, from an, in the Old Testament, the most relevant book for the church. That sounds like a contradiction. But it's interesting that even the Jewish community always reads it at the time of Shavuot. Now what is about Shavuot all about? It's the only place that Moses in the Feast of Moses where they use leavened bread. What's all that about? There's something strange going on that even most Jews don't realize. We'll talk about it. But clearly, when you speak of the church prophetically or dispensationally, the book of Ruth will surface because it so clearly profiles the role and the mission of the kinsman redeemer. What is all that about? And as I say, it's an essential prerequisite book of Revelation. So we're in chapter 1, we're going to see love's resolve. And that's where Ruth decides to claim to Naomi. In chapter 2, we'll see love's response. And that's where Ruth gleans for Naomi. And chapter 3 is love's request. And we have this very strange, widely misunderstood scene at the thrashing floor. Most secular people reading that have no grasp what on earth is going on there. And then the fourth, the big climax is love's reward. So chapters 1, 2, 3, and 4 are love's resolve, its response, its request, and its reward. And uh, so that's the redemption of both the land to Naomi and the bride to Boaz. And that's the, that, that's the, the big plot issue that will unravel here. So this session we're going to jump into now is chapter 1, love's resolve. It, it introduces the characters and what's going on here. And so now... One of the things, the more you understand the Jewish uh, feasts, the stranger it is that this scroll, the book of Ruth, is always read in Jewish communities at the time of Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks. And you ask them, why do they do that? Well, they say it's sort of associated with harvest and so forth. Maybe there's something far deeper going on here. And... uh, When you study the seven feasts of Moses, this is the unique one. It's the only feast in the Bible in which leavened bread uh, is is, uh, used. And uh, we'll explain why later and so forth. 
So let's just jump in. Ruth chapter 1, verse 1. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. Okay? This first sentence tells you what the incident is, where it took place, when it took place, and generally how it took place, okay? And when the judges ruled, that was a dark time, not a spiritual high time. And uh, the whole Ruth event takes place during this very disappointing era. And uh, that's the period of time after Joshua had conquered the land, but before they had a king. There's a, a, a window in there. And so uh, between Joshua and the monarchy, rulership was under the judges. It was a time of scandals. Our prom most prominent player there was, was Samson. Colorful, lots of mischief, but pointless. Really a, a, a spiritually a disappointment. And so, and we find that uh, there was a famine in the land. There are, famines are an issue here. If there's 13 of them in the Bible. And it's the reason why the family, Naomi and Elimelech and their two sons, leave uh, Judea. They go east to Moab because they, there's food there. And so uh, this is the, the, that's their response to God's judgment, apparently. Fam may be a response to the spiritual condition of the country at the time. And uh, famines we know took place during the times of Abraham, Genesis 12, David in 2 Samuel 21, Elijah, 1 Kings 17, and Gideon and Judges. They, they, they happen frequently. And uh, so... We think this story probably occurred during specifically the time of Gideon. Drought and famine were among the judgments God would come upon the land as a result of failure to keep the law. And there's these, no, these uh, references are in your notes, so you can double back on this at your leisure. And uh, the book of Judges provides ample evidence of their failure to keep the law that brought about the famine in the days of Gideon. So it had to last for several years in order to compel them to leave the land and go to Moab. Now, strangely enough, the whole process of redemption will hang on the fact that Naomi left the land. She may become a, a, a type, if you will, of the diaspora. And that's going to get significant if that's true as we go. Ten years would pass before Naomi would hear that the famine had ended. In other words, they left went to Moab, lived there 10 years before she heard that it was worthwhile to go back home. But a lot had transpired by then. We'll get into that here in a minute. So the, uh, the Midianites, we know, oppressed Israel for about seven years, and the oppression included the destruction to, of the produce from the soil uh, from this famine that would naturally follow. And so that's all in Judges 6 and so on. But, uh, okay. A certain man from Bethlehem, Judah. See, there's a couple of Bethlehems, by the way. There's a, there's a, there is a Bethlehem in Zebulun. But when we talk of Bethlehem, we mean Bethlehem Ephrathah or Bethlehem Judah, if you will. And so this is the guy that's going to be the center of our story. Uh, and uh, so he went to sojourn in the country of Moab and so forth. And uh, it is this, by the way, this book that links David to the city of Bethlehem is the point. And he went to sojourn, and that means to be a resident alien and to live among people who are not blood relatives as a foreigner, because they would be among the Moabites foreigners, if you will. And so, uh, uh, and Moab, of course, was the son of Lot, the evil fruit of an incestuous relationship with one of his daughters. And uh, there's a pretty dismal background here. The Moabites had hired Balaam to curse Israel during Israel's pilgrimage to Canaan in Numbers 22. And uh, in, under normal circumstances, the Moabites were barred from participation in the national corporate life of Israel. They were very, very separate, in other words, okay. And, uh, but they were friendly, pretty much. The relationship between some of the individual Israelites and Moabites was, was good. And the, uh, when, when fleeing the wrath of Saul, David found a friend among, in the king of Moab. So even though they're separate, there have been occasions where uh, they were friendly. So 
Now the name of the man here was Elimelech and the name of his wife Naomi and the name of his two sons Malan and Kilian. One of the things we can infer from the second verse is that names are relevant to the story. We generally don't necessarily attribute relevance to names or just labels. But we notice here especially that these labels are very, very descriptive. And uh, so Elimelech means God is my king at a strange time when they had no king. Naomi means pleasant. She's going to suggest they call her bitter rather than pleasant before it's all over, but that's, her name actually means pleasant. And one of the synonyms for Israel is pleasant land. So we can almost see this setup here where Naomi will tend to be to typify the nation Israel. And uh, so... And Malan from the root of Kela, which means to be sick, unhealthy, sickly. <laughs> That's a tough label to go through school with, isn't it? Well, his brother is no better. Kilian means wasting or pining. These are the names of the two sons. But Elimelech, Neo's husband, dies, so she's now a widow. And she was left and her two sons. Get the picture. She's in a foreign country. Her husband's die, died. When they, when they left... Judea, they forfeited the, by departure his inheritance. So they had, she had nothing. She's a widow in a foreign country with two sons. And the two sons are going to die here, we'll see. Okay. And they took them wives of the women of Moab. The name of one was Orpah and the name of the other Ruth. And they dwelled there about 10 years. Now the law of Moses in Deuteronomy 7 did not actually forbid marriage with the Moabites as it forbade marriage with Canaanite women. But in Deuteronomy 23, the law did forbid the reception of Moabites into the congregation of the Lord until the 10th generation. But we're going to see grace will get around all that, but that's the general rule. Now, Moab is my wash pot. This occurs twice in the Psalms. So Moab is not a very complimentary label here. And Gentile marriage is forbidden in Deuteronomy 7, and uh, in Deuteronomy 23. And so, now Orpah, the, her name itself means fawn or gazelle, and uh, Ruth uh, means uh, friendship or desirable, reasonably, reasonably enough. Now the two sons married these two gals. Machlon married Ruth. Gillian married Opa. We don't find out the linkage until we get to the fourth chapter, but it's incidental to our story anyway. And so, now by the way, in Moses' day, it was the Moabite women who seduced the Jewish men into immorality and idolatry. And as a result of that, 24,000 people died. That's all in Numbers 25. And so, Jews are forbidden to marry Gentile women, especially those from Ammon and Moab. And that's all through the Torah, if you will. And so... Now, Malan and Kilian died also, both of them. Picture the, the destitute situation of Naomi. Her husband's de dead. Her two married sons, having married foreigners, they've died, and she's left then of her, uh, of her two sons and her husband. And so the land was lost, and part of the story here will be Naomi regaining the land she lost, okay? And uh, when Elimelech left Bethlehem, he lost his property. He either sold it or it lost through indebtedness. We don't know. But that's a loss to the family, obviously. And uh, so, okay. And then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the country of Moab how that the Lord had visited his people in giving them bread. In other words, she, they're living for 10 years in Moab. Her husband dies, the two sons die. She now hears that things are better back home, so she decides to go back uh, to her own people, okay? And so the Lord had visited his people in giving them bread. And what's the name for bread in Hebrew? Lechem. Bethlehem means the house of bread. You see this thing is weaving? In, do you see the design going on here? These names are not accidental. Bethlehem, the house of bread. Wherefore she went forth out of the place where she was, and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on the way to return unto the land of Judah. And Naomi said unto her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each to your mother's house, her mother's house. 
and the Lord deal kindly with you as ye have dealt with the dead and with me. So Naomi's leaving. She's going home. She's telling the two gals to stay in their homeland and somehow, you know, make that work. And so she says, The Lord grant you that ye may find rest, each of you in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voice and wept. And they said unto her, Surely we will return with thee unto thy people. So they want to go along with Naomi, their mother-in-law, to, back to Ju uh, Judea, okay? Naomi said, Turn again, my daughters. Why will ye go with me? Are there yet any more sons in my womb that they might be your husbands? As, as Naomi starts to argue with them, you, I, 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 I regret that I don't have the gift of these, uh, these uh, 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 ability to imitate the, the, the Jewish inflections here. You almost have to read this with a good New York Jewish accent to hear the, the, the ironic logic here. Why will you go with me? Are there any yet any more sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? Turn again, my daughters, go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. And if I should say I have hope, if I should have a husband also tonight and should also bear sons, would ye tarry for them until they are grown? <laughs> would ye stay with them for having husbands? Nay, my daughters, for it grieveth me much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. So she tries to talk them out of it. Notice, though, she attributes all of this to the, Lord of the Lord's hand being against her. And uh, she realized, she recognized that it wasn't pure chance. And they lifted up their voice and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clave under her. In other words, Orpah agrees with Naomi and she stays. But Ruth does just the opposite. Okay? See, or Orpah goes back into oblivion. We know nothing else of her. But Ruth claved to her. And boy, that's a big deal. The actual Hebrew word is dabak, which means to stick like glue. And this is the very same clause that induced Orpah to return home is what caused Ruth to stay. The fact that Naomi will no longer have a husband or sons meant that she needed someone to take care of her. And that's what motivated Ruth to stay. She motivation was to take care of Naomi. And uh, I don't know how many of you girls feel that way about your mother-in-law, but we'll move on here. And she said, Behold, thy sister-in-law has gone back unto her people and unto her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. Naomi is still trying to talk Ruth into staying uh, in, in Moab. The, the, she's gone back to her people and unto her gods. You need to understand the Moabites worshipped a different god. And they were uh, Shemosh. And uh, the, uh, the, the national god of Moab was Shemosh. You'll find that in Numbers 21 and 1 Kings 11. And incidentally, they, uh, Shemosh accepted human sacrifices. You're dealing with heavy paganism here. That was the gods that Orpah and Ruth grew up with. And so... Um, that's why it, it makes sense, in a sense, for Orpah to stay with that culture. That's what she's used to. But it's astonishing that Ruth feels quite distinctively different. And uh, by the way, all, a lot of this is on the famed Moabite stone, by the way. And uh, the Moabite stone was discovered in 1868 by a German missionary. And it is in, uh, it's about four feet high, contains about 34 lines in an alphabet very similar to ancient Hebrew. And it was probably erected about 850 B.C. by King Mesha, of the Moabite king. And uh, it, it celebrated his overthrow of the nation Israel. And the biblical account makes it clear that Israel was actually victorious. So there's a discrepancy there. But in any case, uh, uh, Mesha honors his god, Shemosh, in terms similar to the Old Testament reverence to the Lord. You know, it's interesting how that always happens. When I was in uh, Egypt, I was startled how they celebrate their victory in the, in the uh, uh, Yom Kippur War. They got clobbered, but they celebrated as if it's a victory. You see, there's, uh, they try to create the impression of the people that that was a victory for them. And so, uh, in here, in the Moabite thing, the inhabitants of entire cities apparently were slaughtered to appease this deity. And, uh, but anyway, let's get on here. The, the, it's, it, there's profound biblical evidence in the Moabite stone. It confirms Old Testament accounts. It's valuable geographically because it mentions no less than 15 sites of the Old Testament 
are mentioned in the Moabite stone. So it's a very valuable find from that point of view. And so, and it's, it's, it's of course, the Paleo-Hebrew. But let's get back to verse 16. Naomi's trying to talk uh, Ruth into staying in Moab, and she said, and it says, And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from following after thee. And here is the famous declaration, probably the most famous declaration in the book. Ruth says, For whither thou goest, I will go, and where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God, my God. Think about that. She was raised in Moab, an idol-worshiping Gentile country. She was abandoning everything. And so, where thou diest, will I die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. What a declaration. What a declaration. The Lord do so to me. Naomi, I mean, uh, Ruth is using the vocabulary of Yehovah. She invoked the name of God in her oath, and not the name of Shemosh, the Moab God. To understand how she has uh, uh, converted her perspective here. There's a sevenfold decision. She says, For whither thou goest, I will go. Where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people. Thy God, my God. Where thou diest, will I die. And there will I be buried. And the Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. And so, <laughs> this sevenfold statement, by the way, is interesting to see that fabric throughout the entire Bible. It's amazing how many passages, when you dissect it, they're always a sevenfold declaration. Okay? And this form, formula is used seven times in the book of Samuel and the Kings. By Eli concerning Samuel, by Saul of Jonathan's execution, Jonathan's friendship with David, David concerning Nabal, David concerning Amasa, Ben-Hadad. So these things, I fa I'm fascinated with these things because they evidence deliberate design. Because even though there's different authors, different books, they have a single uh, author, the Holy Spirit. And uh, so we have these seven occasions. Okay. In Deuteronomy 23, it says, An Ammonite or Moabite shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord. Even to their tenth generation shall they not enter into the congregation of the Lord. See, it takes ten generations to get the residency, so to speak, if I can put it that way. Remember that tenth generation because it's going to be important as we unfold when we get to chapter four. How could Ruth enter into the congregation of the Lord? By trusting God's grace and throwing herself completely on his mercy, which is exactly what she did, and that's what exactly worked here. The law may exclude us from God's family, but grace includes it if we put our faith in the kinsman redeemer. That's the lesson that lurks in this entire fabric here. And so, the genealogy of Genesis Christ in, in, in Matthew 4 includes the name of five women, four of whom have very questionable credentials. Tamar committed incest with her father-in-law, and we'll talk about that in session four. Rahab was a Gentile harlot, and Rahab was the mother of Boaz, by the way, we'll discover. Ruth was an outcast, an uh, uh, outcast Gentile Moabitess. And the wife of Uriah, which is the way Bathsheba is mentioned in the genealogy in Matthew 4, was an adulteress. So four of the five women there that are mentioned in the genealogy of Christ were, had uh, rather cloudy reputations. And so, okay. The sovereign mercy and grace of God. One of the things that fascinates me is God has gone to such extremes for you and me. And yet, when all is said and done, God does not get what he wants. What? No, remember God says he's long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Do all come to repentance? No. So despite his extreme reach for our behalf, he doesn't get what he really wants. I find that provocative. Anyway, how did they all become part of the family tree? The same way we did. 
Okay, verse 18. And when she saw, that is when Naomi saw, that Ruth was steadfastly minded to go with her, she left speaking unto her. In other words, <laughs> she, 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 she let that go, okay? Now, they would have to go about 75 miles. And that's not in a straight line because they'd have to ascend the Moabite highlands to the Jordan Valley, from the highlands to the Jordan Valley, a descent of about 4,500 feet, followed by an, by an ascent to Bethlehem of about 3,750 feet, walking through desert territory through the wilderness of Judah. So we, in, in just that one verse, we're now going to find ourselves in Bethlehem because they made that trip. But you need to understand they, they had quite a journey, the two of them, on their own, okay? So they too went until they came to Bethlehem. And it came to, and how, what an appropriate name, the house of bread. That's why they're going there. And they, by doing this, make Bethlehem famous. In a lot of ways, we'll see. And it came to pass when they were come to Bethlehem that all the city was moved about them. And they said, is this Naomi? And she said to them, call me not Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me. Now see, Naomi really uh, means pleasant. Don't call me pleasant. Call me bitter. Mara means bitter. And uh, so, for the Almighty, now the, the word she uses here, the word Almighty, El Shaddai, and Shaddai actually means the breast, the provider. We tra translate it Almighty, but it's actually a label uh, 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 as the source of nourishment, if you will. And so, uh, the name of God. It's used 48 times in the Old Testament. Although 31 of those are in the book of Job alone. I went out full, Naomi says, and the Lord hath brought me home again empty. Why then call me Naomi, seeing the Lord hath testified against me, and the Almighty hath afflicted me? So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, with her, which returned out of the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem, in the beginning of the barley harvest. Now, that little closing phrase is intended to be a pickup. The barley harvest is a, this is an upbeat. And one of the things that you're going to need to have a, a, a flavor for is the calendar if you're going to study your, your Bible. The barley ripened before the wheat and began to be reaped sometime as early as March, but generally in April or Abib. And so, the barley harvest is the first hint of something joyful. Up till now, this whole experience has been pretty dark. Because of the famine, they leave their homeland. When they get to this strange country, the husband dies. The sons who get married, they die. It's, it's, a, it's a, a, a dismal tale so far. But there's a change coming. And they, they arrive there at the beginning of the barley harvest. Now, one of the things that Rabbi Hirsch said many years ago, it's very interesting, he says, the Jew's catechism is his calendar. If you're going to understand Jewishness, the Jewishness of, of the Bible, you need to have a feeling for their calendar. And the whole idea is that the, their calendar is their catechism. They have a heptatic calendar, a sevenfold. They have a week of days. Most of us recognize that. The seventh day is Shabbat. They also have a week of weeks. That's called Shavuot when they celebrate that. They have a week of months. The religious year is a seven-month cycle. And the, seven, the week of years is the sabbatical year. Did you know that the one, one year in seven, the ground is to be let rested and so forth? When you take seven weeks plus one, you have the Jubilee year. All land return, reverts to its owners. All slaves go free. All debts are forgiven. And the time of the rest, and and Peter uses the phrase the time of restitution of all things to speak of the jubilee year. One thing you need to understand: you didn't sell land. We think of selling land as fee simple, where you get title of the land. They didn't do that way. The land belonged to the Lord; it belonged to Israel. What you could sell was your right to use the land. We would call that a lease. But they would, when they sold land, they sold its use for a certain number of years. And if it was sold, as out of desperation and so forth, a relative could come and redeem the land by paying the part that was still 
uh, viable, if you will. And so that's what they call uh, redeeming the land. And we're going to see that. Uh, Elimelech obviously had forfeited his land. But what's going to transpire here is a way for that land to be regained for Naomi's benefit. And we need to understand how that works for a lot of reasons. So Now, it's interesting when you study the Torah, in Genesis chapter 1, it says, God said, let there be lights in the firmament of heaven to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. That's in your English translation. The word for seasons there is hamoyadim, which really means the appointed times. The lights in the firmament set certain for signs and for uh, highlighting the appointed times. Now, the appointed times, it turns out any Jew would know there are 70 of those. There are 52 Saturdays, 52 Sabbaths, as we would think of it. There are seven days of Passover, when you include its related feast days. Then there's Shavuot, Yom Teruah, the Feast of Trumpets. Then Yom Kippur, the Feast of uh, uh, the Day of Atonement. Seven days of Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles. And the Shemini Atzeret, the Eighth Day of Assembly. When you add that up, any Jew knows that he has 70 appoint, Hamoyedim, appointed times. Now, something very strange is, if you take the Hamoyedim, the appointed times, as an equidistant letter sequence, you discover, surprisingly, it only occurs once in the book of Genesis. It's statistical expectation. You think about five times if you go at it statistically, but it, does, it, it doesn't. You know, it shows up only once. The interval it shows up is 70, and it is centered on Genesis 1.14. Now, how did all that happen? Accidentally? Of course not. It is another one of these strange things that evidence designed. The chance of this happening accidentally is one chance in 70 million to one. And so, but something else I want you to be sensitive to as we go through Ruth is the agricultural calendar. We are used to the, agri the on the Gregorian calendar, it's the March-April time period. On the Jewish calendar, the first month of the religious year is Nisan. And uh, the farming calendar, is, it's, uh, that's where the later rains the barley harvest and the flax harvest occurs. The special days in that area is Nisan 14, which of course is Passover, and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and uh, the Feast of First Fruits. Those three feasts together collectively are called, pa they, they are associated with Passover. And so Nisan, uh, the, the Feast of First Fruits is always the Sunday following Shabbat, following Passover. Very strange formula, but it makes it always on a Sunday, by the way, interestingly enough. But the, uh, the, the next uh, month on the Jewish calendar would be uh, Iyar, which is uh, uh, the, when the dry season begins. And then you get to May, June. The third, uh, you have Savan, the early figs ripen and the vine tending occurs. The special days there are Shavuot. That's 50 days after the Feast of First Fruits. In the Jewish liturgy, the scroll of Ruth is always read on Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks. Interesting enough. When you understand Shavuot, it's very appropriate because that's really uh, the thing that celebrates the, uh, the, the what we call it the Feast of Pentecost. Interesting. Uh, what happened in Acts chapter 2? Moving on, uh, the, the fourth month would be uh, Tammuz, and the farming calendar would be the wheat harvest, and that's the first ripe grapes. Notice that's in the June-July time period. And uh, so... And then we, in the fifth month, we get July, August, and we have the, uh, the grape harvest, if you will, and uh, in July, August. Now, uh, uh, the uh, ninth of Ab is the traditional date that there's bad, always bad news. Whatever bad happens in Israel, it's always on the ninth of Ab, interestingly enough. A small point to make note here is that the grapes are harvested in that fifth month, the month of Ab, or our July, August time period which tells you, for one thing, where they, in a culture that has no refrigeration, there's no way you can get grape juice in the spring because it has its own way of protecting itself called fermentation. So I'm always amused by that, all these people that try to use grape juice at communion. That's fine to do for a number of reasons, but you need to understand that wasn't biblical. They had wine. But we'll move on. The uh, August-September time period, the sixth thing, is the Feast of Elul, and that's where the dates in the summer figs are, 
harvested. And then we get to September, October, the, the, the month of Tishri, which is the, uh, that's the first month on the Genesis calendar. It's the seventh month on the, uh, the uh, Exodus calendar. But the early rains and the special days then, of course, the Feast of Trumpets, Yom Kippur, and Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles. So that is the quick perspective of the Jewish calendar. You need to have a grasp of that as you read your Bible, because it's a, unless you have an agricultural root, you wouldn't be sensitive to that. But hopefully that will be useful to you. So just to summarize where we've been, in chapter 1, we have Ruth cleaving. It was in the days the judges ruled. The famine drives the family to Moab. Elimelech dies. Naomi is left destitute. Malan and Killian, the unhealthy and puny sons, are, uh, are, uh, uh, have passed on. And so Naomi deters her daughters-in-law from following. Orpah ultimately does return to her own people. But Ruth clings to Naomi. And her very name it means desirable. So that all sets the stage for the very peculiar events that occur in chapter 2. So for your next session, I want you to study carefully Ruth chapter 2. And if you get the time, you can also study the law of gleaning. They have a very strange way of dealing with what you and I would call welfare. The, the law in Leviticus 19 and Deuteronomy 24, the concept was very simple. A landowner with his harvesters, could pass through his land once and only once. What they missed was left for the destitute, the widows and orphans. And so that was the way they were operated. You, could, you owning the land could make a pass and take your harvest. But what, what you missed, what fell at the wayside, you left. Because following your professionals would come the, the widows and orphans taking what they could, and that was their way of providing for the destitute. They call that the law of gleaning. And Ruth, obviously, is taking care of Naomi and earning quite a reputation for herself, it turns out. But she goes to glean. It's harvest time, so she'll follow the harvesters and uh, as a way of gathering uh, produce for Naomi. Except something very unusual happens the, the field that she happens to glean on happens to be a field of a relative of Elimelech. And therein starts, the plot starts to unfold. And uh, we'll watch that next time. So let's bow our hearts for a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for the word that you've given us, this precious, precious book of Ruth. We pray, Father, that you would help us understand the predicament they faced and how they dealt with it. And Father, we pray that you would help us understand the unique role of the kinsman redeemer as we endeavor to understand better our kinsman redeemer. We thank you, Father, for this book. We thank you for what it's teaching. We pray, Father, that through your Holy Spirit, you would help us appropriate what you have for us here and what you would have us do in response to these things that you've provided for us as we commit ourselves into your hands in the name of Yeshua, our kinsman redeemer indeed. Amen. God has a specific plan for Israel, a specific plan for the church, and they're in a certain sense mutually exclusive. They're parallel, but separate. And uh, so, one of the things we also want to adjust ourselves to is that there are multiple levels of understanding. There's, of course, typically a primary application, historical, an event that actually happened, it occurred in the time of the judges. We want to understand the period during which this, these events take place. And that's the historical sense. But there's another aspect to our study, and that's what we'll call practical, or homiletic, if you will. How do you apply it to our own lives? There's going to be things here that uh, we'll want to be sensitive to. We're also going to discover some prophetic revelations 
some mystic or prophetic insights that will come that may surprise you. And then, of course, in, in the Hebrew hermeneutic, they have an area called the remez. That's a hint of something deeper. Sometimes there'll be a little issue that will open the door to a whole nother perspective. And we'll see some of that occurring here too. Hermeneutics is the theory of interpretation. We regard this book as an essential prerequisite to a study of the book of Revelation, by the way. And uh, one, of our, one of my basic themes in my ministry, as you know, is that these 66 books we call the Bible are a single message system, intricately designed. Every detail is there deliberately by design. And we're going to see some of that unfold as we go forward here. Now, in Ruth, every detail not only carries the romance along, but it carries along the romance of redemption. We need to understand what do we mean by redemption. And so it's going to give us, you and me, it's going to give us a perspective of God's plan for us. You and I are going to be profiled here in a a very surprising way. We're going to discover a concept called the goel. In Hebrew, it's called the kinsman redeemer. What is that really all about? And you won't understand Revelation chapter 5 unless you really understand this background. You're also going to see the distinctives between Israel and the church. One of the tragic byproducts of Christianity today is confusion on that subject. Well, hello there. Welcome to our study of the book of Ruth. And whenever we enter the Word of God, we want to do it with prayer. So let's bow our hearts. Father, we thank you for this precious book. We thank you for this time together. And we solicit the Holy Spirit to open this book and our lives to your Word, that we might grow in grace and the knowledge of our precious Savior, in whose name we commit this time, in Jesus' name indeed. Amen. The book of Ruth, and uh, we're in the first of four sessions, and uh, it's very strange if somebody asks you, what's my favorite book of the Bible? There's a lot of good candidates, Genesis, Revelation, whatever, but I have to say that uh, very likely the book of Ruth would be at the top of the list. That may sound strange. A little tiny four-chapter book. Uh, This little book is venerated even in secular college literature classes. It's considered one of the most elegant love stories uh, in writing. But it also encapsulates that which we call the romance of redemption. But one of the things we'll need to do in order to really understand this book is to lay it against the fabric of ancient Israel. There are three groups of laws that we that are very strange that we need to understand and about redemption, gleaning, and the Leverite marriage. So we'll get into those as we go. But to be prepared for some surprises. And why this particular book? You know, it's interesting that this book, little four-chapter narrative, little love story, is one of the most dramatic books of prophecy in the Bible. And the ancient Jewish scriptures often included the book of Ruth with the book of the prophets. And that may surprise you. But it, uh, uh, and uh, as I pointed out earlier, that uh, there are over 200 rhetorical devices or figures of speech in the Bible. And we notice in Hosea chapter 12, 10, God says, I've spoken by the prophets and I have multiplied visions and used similitudes by the ministry of the prophets. Similitudes are just one of 200 different kinds of rhetorical devices you find in the scripture. We tend to think in Greek terms, which is prophecy is a prediction and fulfillment. 
That's what we think of as prophecy. That's the Greek mind at work. A prediction and its fulfillment. That's not the Hebrew model. The Hebrew model is a little different. Prophecy is pattern. One of the things you'll discover as you study the Hebrew literature is they continually uh, see patterns. The patterns of the Messiah are profiled in Israel and vice versa. They're very, very oriented to patterns. And we're going, we're going we, we, we see that when we study Genesis 22, the Akedah. It's that, a pattern where Abraham knows he's acting out prophecy that several thousand years later on that very spot, another father did offer his son and so forth. And uh, so prophecy is pattern. We're going to see one of the most phenomenal